Well, that settles it. Now I know you're a liar. There just ain't no way you're bored on your first flight. You thought we'd be floating around fighting bug aliens with rocket launchers and flamethrowers. Uh-huh. Just out of curiosity, what was the last movie you watched? Australian Revengeance, Return to Hell, right? Well, I had to break it to you, but we need gravity on to keep the cargo down. And any sort of fire in a contained environment is a bad idea. What we're doing right now is about as exciting as it gets. I've got a fly swatter in the cabin if things get hairy. Ah, oh, now don't give me that look. You know I hate puppy dog eyes. Come on. What can Grandpa do to make it better? A story? I ain't no good at damn stories. I ramble and I wander all over the place. Sword age, catching up with me. You know, I used to remember every code in the fleet. I can tell you some if you want. Alright, alright, fine. What do you want to hear about? The Garcelle? Huh. Reckon I could work with that. How's about... The last mission we flew together. I was running down to this colony planet, all bogs and rivers. Tertian, terrain, something like that. I swear half the planets in this galaxy are named after dirt, and the rest are just random letters. I was finding some hotshot who took a half ass flyby in one of our haulers. No, I was not going to blow him up with my rocket launcher. We'll get there. Patience. The colony had just hit the ground, and it wasn't quite running yet. They hadn't even had time to properly clear the landing strip. There was still waterlogged grass and hangdog trees, swaying and shaking like a hurricane was pulling in. In all fairness, one kind of was. Old Garcelle roared white fire and black belch every time we went planetside. She was a pennate model, made during the water wars. Think twin rockets stuck in the centre of a circular frame. Always said she was the only lucky penny I needed. There were larger ships at the landing strip, smaller ones too. All shapes and sizes really, which was usually a good sign. Every species has their own idea on what proper design is. The more there are, the less you stand out. At least it used to be that way. The cast and pass boom hadn't quite gotten off the ground yet. You could still tell how well a captain was doing by how much crab they had on their hull. Flash, they called it. My Garcelle was standard template. Only thing on her were four black diamonds painted above three narrow letters. VSU. Once upon a time, everyone and their mother knew those letters. Once upon a time, those four diamonds watched over every fleet worth a damn in the entire galaxy. But then, the world did what it does best. It got larger and wilder, faster than people could keep up. Engines started running farther and harder, going for longer without needing to stop. More trips, more cargo. Better pay. Roaming caravans and rumbling resupply tankers are a thing of the past, and it's every captain for themselves. At least, that's what people say. Because there's still convoys, sailing in the Voice Sea. There's still the Andromeda Convoy. We started as a standard mining operation, bought and paid for by some minor corporation. The lane we took between our belt and dropper point was isolated, long and infested with near jumps. Moons orbiting gas giants, asteroids big enough to hold atmosphere, that sort of thing. In other words, it was the perfect breeding ground for pirates. Miners died if they didn't have enough ore for ransom. Since the very beginning, there have been two premiums void side. Oxygen and water. Pirates take them as collateral. So we went to our bosses, hats in one hand and petitions in the other. You know what we heard back? We here at Orco are very sorry to hear about your pirate raids. Unfortunately, the Andromeda Y-1866 mining sector has reported below average fiscal earnings in the last quarter. As per company policy, you are 142nd in priority, and may expect a representative in... blank days. Thank you for working at Orco. I still have that response posted right there on my bridge. Keeps the bones warm and chilly days. Go on, 100 points if you can dart the logo from here. Nice row, son. Now, where was I? Right, how the VSU was born. As you can imagine, nobody took that half assed reply very well. We reckoned we were on our own in every way that mattered. So we did the only thing we could do. We banded together. Standard doctrine at the time was to travel alone or in small groups, make yourself less of a target. But this was all or nothing. We flew in the face of tradition and we did it in style. Bigger ships sat in the middle. We filled them up with enough fuel for everybody and put our bravest boys in the driver's seat. They had to be. Fuel is the target of choice of smart pirates. It's the only way to cripple an entire convoy. 
If the big rigs run, everyone goes down with them. Not one in the Andromeda colony ever has. Like I said, brave boys. Haulers were next. They rode backside on the way there, frontside on the way back. Their job was to get the asteroids moving and keep them on track. And let me tell you, it was a sight the first time they pulled it off. Imagine a line of 40 ships, all managing about 10 asteroids at a time. Looks like a meteor shower with manners. Crazy Busterhem. Crazy Sandra- Damn. Don't laugh at me like that, son. You know your mother don't like me swearing in front of you. What? No. Damn don't count as a swear. Don't tell her I said that. Anyway. Each and every hauler were some of the craziest damn pilots I ever did see. Turns out if you give a bunch of flyboy zero-g matter manipulators, they push the limits on what their toys can do. They used to play catch with each other before VSU regulations got started proper. Of course, haulers still come in for meteorite strikes every once in a while. Long as it doesn't get too out of hand, we let them have their fun. Damn hooligans. Then there were the messages. They were ace in a hole, the innovation that got us where we are today. This may come as a surprise to you, but space is big, son. Big enough to wander to the end of time and still not see everything there is. So when a convoy is gliding over the face of forever and inertia alone, there ain't many ways to find them. Unless they're screaming their heads off at each other. Remember, Orko is cheap. We didn't get the type of gear that keeps hackers on the outside and cops on the inside. Even a colony with perfect discipline needs to communicate every once in a while. Doing it over Orko tech was like ringing the dinner bell. Little side note. Turns out they installed those on purpose. Made it easier to listen in on miners and direct their motivational efforts. We dug that little tippet up just in time for the trial. Wonder of wonders. Both those things are highly illegal. But that's another story entirely. The question at the time was, how do you compete with pirates holding all the cards? Well, you don't. So we came up with our own game. Every ship a single person pass meant to be used in case of emergency. You slap a tether on it and install some short range radios, you can go old school. Real old school. Original mudball old school. So low tech is barely tech at all. Morse code. You can't hack a radio, and by the time you're close enough to listen in, you're in sensor range. It ain't as efficient as ship to ship communication, but none of it's floating dead in the void because a pack of pirates heard you were alone and running out of fuel. It's the messengers who maintain, monitoring, God forbid, man the pods if something goes wrong. They do their job quickly and they do it well. Andromeda still uses them when we want to keep it quiet. Even though we have proper gear these days. Old habits die hard, I suppose. Finally, you had the pilots. One of them rode in the ship called the Garcel. We were fast and we were light. We could afford to be because the big rigs let us fuel up any time. But we also had to be. Our weapons were speed, surprise and whatever second-rate guns were left over from the water wars. In that order... You had to gamble on how much fuel you put in your ship. Less meant you were quicker, lighter on your feet. It also meant you might not be able to make it back to the convoy. More made you slower, easier to pick off. But you could fly farther and burn harder. I preferred the latter myself. The haulers were already carrying my share of rocks, so I didn't see the need to push the envelope. Besides, I'd rather get blown up than left adrift. Seems like a bad way to go, anyway you cut it. Luckily, there wasn't something we needed to worry about until later. The first few passes of pirates went our way. They'd underestimate us and drift right on in every damn time. Then a bunch of pissed off pilots started swimming out. You ever seen a pack of wolves bring down a caribou? We dash in close, snip at fuel lines or weapon systems, then get to a blind spot. It was dangerous, and it took time to pull off. But seeing a ship start to float dead in the void, one that was trying to kill you, chock full of weapons and armor right for the salvaging... I'd be lying if I said it wasn't a rush. The only question was what to do with the crews. Some of the boys figured an eye for eye justice. Some wanted to press gang them, and a couple just wanted to leave them floating. Eventually, we'd landed on leaving that decision to the pirates. It won't surprise you to hear that most of them chose to join up. It's actually how I met your grandma. Though that story definitely has to wait until you're older. That's right, son. You got pirate blood right through your veins. Probably why I keep catching you in my snack jar. They're protein bars and hard candy, you hear? Why do you want them so damn bad? No, you can't bribe your way back into my good graces. Unless you hand over the last cinnamon stick. I know you have it. Come on, cough it up. Mm, tastes like victory. Anyway. We knew the pirates would rise up eventually. 
Figured we had two or three convoys before we started seeing some serious pushback. Still, those trips gave us experience, and plenty of it. Salvage, too. Everything on the pirate ship was put to good use. Thumbtacks to railguns. By the start of our fourth convoy, we were running with proper armor and actual weapons. Not a moment too soon, either. As we closed in on the bell, we got a blip in our sensors. Then another, and another. Pretty soon we were looking at a full fleet. Different clans and desperados all laid out in a semicircle, just waiting. There were final rides, crazy moons, the chop shop enclave. Seemed like every scumbag in free assistance had flown over to join the party. I even saw BS Jackson prancing around in his golden ship. Everyone there claims they were the one who shot him down. But I'll let you in on that little secret. It was actually me. I still don't know how that many pirates were in one place without killing each other. I still don't know which captain convinced him it was worth it, but I hope he survived. I hope he escaped. Pirates aren't very kind to liabilities who turn paydays into bloodbaths. One of theirs told us to surrender. One of ours told him to kick rocks. Well, none of them said it quite like that, but I still ain't allowed to swear. We still had the numbers, but everything else was about even. We were faster, they had better armor. We were on par in salvage firepower, but not systems. They were more experienced in ship-to-ship -ship combat. We were better at maneuvers. That turned into our saving grace. Pirates as a rule prefer smaller groups, makes splitting the loot that much easier. But it also meant they had no idea what they were doing with more than four ships at a time. They were clumsy, flying in front of each other and cutting their own lines of fire. We tore them apart, ship by ship, but they bit back and they bit hard. Too damn hard. Poor Hansen. They hit him early. His big rig was spinning, fuel leaking out from a hole in the side. Everyone knew he was dead in the void, we were just too damn focused on surviving to help. But he was corkscrewing towards their formation. They didn't care too much about that, until he lit up his reactor. He managed to catch free in the blast and more in the shockwave. It ignited all the fuel he left trailing behind. One almighty flash followed by a spiral of fire. At least he got a Viking funeral. That shook them, but it was still rough going. Everyone was stuck in now. We needed fuel from the pirates to make it back safely. They needed this haul or they were finished. It got desperate on both sides. I don't think I want to talk about it anymore. We took stock after the battle. Almost half the convoy was down, but there was a treasure trove of salvage floating around. Some damn good ships. Ones that had cost us blood to bring down while waiting for new owners. It didn't feel real. It was like we cheated the universe, like we were the ones meant to be dead in the void. But we weren't. And that's when we decided to make it official. That was the day we became the VSU. Void Sailors Union. Still has a nice ring to it, even after all these years. We came up with our design on the flight back. Had a big contest, winner takes BS Jackson ship. There were a lot of good ideas, plenty of bad ones, and a couple that looked like they were sent in by a feral pack of drunken children. Probably from haulers. But eventually we set it on the symbol that stuck with us to this day. Four diamonds in formation, guarding an empty center. One for the big rigs, bravest boys I've ever known, they never run as steady as stone. One for the haulers, even though they're damn crazy. If you're going to dance with the asteroids, it sure as hell helps to be. One for the messengers, our rock-solid foundation. You want something said quiet, you send it out their way. One for the pilots, who all fly together. Keep your wings in tight and watch out for each other. And one empty center for the fallen runners. No matter your diamond, we all serve the convoy. I know, I know. I promised you a story about the Garcelle. Told you I was going to ramble. To make a very, very long story short, we kept growing from there. We spread our ideas, our tactics, what worked and what didn't. Eventually, we started sending out diamonds to teach those lessons. It made me real proud seeing a convoy start to stand on its own two feet. Some of my happiest memories are watching my boys fly around, four fresh diamonds painted on their hull. Probably why I stayed as long as I did in that job. Felt like I was making a difference, one fleet at a time. We were talking about my last mission. If you remember, I was going down there because some damn fool tried to rip rocks off from haulers. That's true, but not for the reasons you might think. I rolled out of my ship and hit the ground for Squelch. Like I said, the colony was founded on bogs and rivers. I didn't mind it too much. Reminded me of home, right down to the stench hanging over everything like a fog. You'd think a nice breeze would be the answer, but no. All that does is give you more of the same. I didn't catch too many looks as I strutted off the landing strip. 
A couple of notch old timers, a couple of glasses from others. That suited me just fine. My first stop was the governor's office. It was ugly. Damn ugly. Made out of half steel and plastic. Except no substitute. Those are the bones of a proper settlement. You can have marble and mahogany after everyone has food in their bellies and a roof over their heads. There was a trickle of colonists, streaming in and out through the sliding doors. Fun in housing, filling reports, fixing what got broke, the logistics of the day to day. Most of them looked happier coming out than they did going in. It made me feel downright optimistic. I walked in, grabbed the ticket, and waited my turn like a good citizen. Took some time to polish up the four diamond stud in my collar. I was ready for an uphill battle. Most colonies value their independence highly, sometimes to a fault. I thought they'd see my jacket and think I was here to wheedle away their freedom. Instead, the governor took one look at me and started chatting away like I was a long-lost friend. She was a hauler. Her name was Maria. She landed this job after taking care of a neighboring convoy. People were harder to manage than 20-ton rocks, but she enjoyed the work. What diamond was I? What convoy did I run? What was my name? I told her I was pilot, working as mentor these days. Introduced myself as Huxton, left out my convoy and last name. We traded stories for a while, me about teaching the young'uns, her about how much she missed playing catch. Damn haulers, they're all the same. Especially your grandma. We kept chewing the fat for a bit, but eventually we landed on what I came in for. I told her about our resident hotshot, and more importantly, what our census picked up about him. I laid out my plan, alongside a couple of papers we had to sign. She'd had a look in her eyes right from the beginning. The papers were signed and sealed as quick as I placed them. She said to take care of it, then report back. Told me even a pilot should be able to handle this one, with a smile. There was my cue to hit the second stop of the day. I rolled back to the landing strip and up to a ship that tried to play chicken with a wall of asteroids. Couldn't tell you what model she was. Close as I could guess was Mutt. Remember how I said well-off captains had toys in the hull? This one was as bare as the garcelle. It didn't even have paint unless you count scorch marks. I tried the door. It was locked. So I went to have a little chat with the dogmaster. I showed him the papers the governor signed me for. Came back with two of his boys. A couple over I coast later and I was stepping into the ship. The first thing I saw was her name, right there on the heading. The Leftovers. She was hard welded and jury rid with whatever pass her owners could come across. There was half steel in the hallway and melted plastic around her ports. Stray tools were loose everywhere, from the ozone in the air they'd been used recently. I made my way deeper inside, patting her side as I did. Told her I was sorry for intruding that I wouldn't be here long. Always be polite to ships, there's good manners and good sense. After ducking and dodging around her mess of a hallway, I found my way to the main deck. There was a monitor running, blue screen lighting up the rest of the empty room. There was code, was rolling across it, scanning for asteroids in the local system. Lured her a couple years out of date, but it did its job. I followed the light up and across the main viewing port. It was reinforced from the inside by metal bars, cutting the half bubble into neat chunks. I looked up and found what I came for. It was an old picture of a family. There was Dad, smiling and holding a torch. Body mask flipped back. I don't know why it stuck with me, but the man had an absolutely gorgeous mustache. His thumb was pointed at a freshly painted heading. There was Mum, leaning up against him and looking proud as could be. She had a toolbox in one hand, a child crater in the other. I got the impression she could handle either with ease. Probably at the same time. There was Grandma and Grandpa, standing on both sides of the couple. Grandma was leaning on a cane, doing her best to look stern and matronly. The shine in her eyes gave the game away. Grandpa was hugging his son tight in one arm, bottle extended in the other. Didn't look like his first. Not that I would know anything about that, of course. And there was their daughter, stood right in the middle. She had her head leaned back, both arms shooting up and out. Looked like she was in the middle of a victory scream. It made me smile. It was a cute picture. The only other thing on that deck were two sleeping rolls. They were too small for adults. I patted the leftovers again on the way out. Told her I was going to make this right if she just held on a bit longer. The Dogmaster's boys must have seen the look on my face. They just stepped aside and let me through. Everyone else too, as I made my way to the only place I could think to find them. There was a scrap metal sign hanging above the door. Call this one the bird nose has. I could tell why the instant I walked in. The standing air had an ABV, and the sitting air was just plain drunk. They charged two quarter moons for a beer, half for a shot, and three fullers for the whole bottle. Corny name. Jeff your booze and highway robbery. Yup. This is a genuine, traditional landing bar. 
I walked in and got a bed that must be made out of solid gold, which was odd, because it looked like we got piss. I didn't need to try to find the kids. They stuck out like a sore thumb. The younger one was right in the middle of a growth spurt, all gangly and thin. He had a jacket on that was two sizes too big, and the beginnings of a glorious mustache legacy grown on his face. His sister was leaned on a stool, keeping an ear on all the hustle and bustle. She had long black hair and a stern look. Both of them did, really. The family resemblance was strong. There was a shot slot down at their table, peering out at them like it wanted a bite. The boy gave it a sniff, real bad with watery eyes and a cough, and slid it on over to his sister, who pushed it right back. Had a professional, I told you so, look on her face. Raised eyebrow and all. I got the sense that someone's eyes being bigger than their stomach. Pride and good sense went to war in his eyes, but it wasn't even close. He got ready to throw the shot down and damn the consequences. And that's about when I made my move. To save his young, impressionable liver, if nothing else. Excuse me, I'm looking for the owners of the leftovers. For half a second, the boy had a relieved look plastered all over his face. Getting saved at the eleventh hour will do that for anybody. Didn't stop him from pulling a mean mug the second that half second was done. What do you want, old man? I sighed and sat down on the barstool next to him. Three things. First, you took a pass at our haulers two days ago. If Lux could kill, that boy would have been dead on the spot. Hell, the glare he was getting from his sister scared me. I knew he pulled that stunt on his lonesome, but doing it without familial approval? That made things a bit easier. You got any proof of that? Trying to sound tough, failing miserably. Harder to pull off when you're shrinking away from somebody a lot meaner. I handed over the report from our sensor array. It had the composition of his ship down to a molecular level, not to mention him, and a threat report based on those factors. It weren't much of a threat. I circled that in red so he couldn't miss it. What's that look for? I told you. Andromeda can afford good toys these days. Secondly, your convoy has added some VSU protections. I gave him the signed document from the governor, as well as a copy of our regulations. As of this morning, you're a pirate who tried to rob a convoy. I saw a flash of fear in his eyes, buried by anger just as quickly. He started to say something. His sister elbowed him in the side. In the bad old days, this is where you get an ultimatum. Go down with your ship, or serve with us for five years, minimum. I waved that last sentence away with my hand. But these ain't the bad old days, and you ain't a mean old pirate, are you, son? He didn't say anything. Just kept staring at me like I was busy kicking dogs. That was fine. I've gotten worse looks. Of course we're not, said his sister. Inserted herself into the equation, earned a bit of cover for her brother. Smart. It's always fun seeing good instincts come into play. Then my bread and butter, after all. Not much good training recruits who need to double check which side of the airlock they're on. Of course you're not, I cut back. Which is why I'm here to ask you, very politely I might add, if either of you would consider joining up. That was a lie, of course. She tied them together for me. All I had to do now was convince one. And I was speaking to the adult. She frowned, spinning the idea around in her head. Her brother snorted, but he called off by now. Hey, they were teenagers. I could excuse a bit of moodiness. Eventually, she decided to play the hand I dealt her. Sounds too good to be true. What's the catch? She said it's sweet, but her eyes were sharp. It made me smile. So I launched into my spiel. It's a damn good spiel. I've had years and years to practice it. I talked about pay, safety, opportunity. I told them about Andromeda Convoy and how proud I was of it. I told them what the center of our diamond meant. At the end of it, she was shining like a Christmas tree, and it was catching. Her brother tried to play it cool, but I could tell he was interested. He had his ears up for every word about the messengers. But then, we got to the dicey part. It was what I'd been dreading since I stepped foot in the ship that morning. Wait, what was the third thing you wanted? You said free earlier, right? It's the leftovers. I'm not going to beat around the bush, son. She ain't safe to fly. Under VSU regulations, she needs to be scrapped, and... That was about as far as I got. Having two guns in your face tends to be a bit distracting, even if you're half expecting it. He was holding a saw off, except loaded up with two long pieces of rebar. Looked like a harpoon gun from where I was sitting. She was holding an old-school revolver. The bullet was eyeing me from the chamber. She said, We're not giving up our ship. He said, Not in your life. I held my hands up, trying to de-escalate the situation. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw patrons edging towards the exit. The smart ones were worried about a straight shot lighting this place up like a tire fire. The rest were probably thinking about the hit their finances would take if a bullet winged their glass. Now, you all didn't let me finish. 
Guns got begrudgingly waved at me. I continued. Under VSU regulation, she needs to be scrapped, but I'm willing to bend the rules just as once. Under a few conditions. You're willing to bend the rules? How the hell are you going to do that? Quick as a wink, both of them. Those are the right questions to ask. Not that I wanted to answer. Nor that I had much choice. Huxton Fairweather, first pilot of the VSU, at your service. They sure as hell didn't know what that meant. But I saw some of the old dogs do a double take. Damn if I don't hate being recognised. And you are? I put my hands back on the table, started sliding one towards their drink. They gave each other a long, slow look. Come on, it's only polite. The girl nodded. The boy rolled his eyes. Alicia Lambros, she said. Definitely not Pyra, at your service. Ajax, he said. What sort of conditions? I took her. Healthy pull of that drink. It almost killed me, but I got what I wanted. Both of them were looking at me with an appropriate mixture of fear and respect. My demands got counted off, finger by finger. First, you both need to complete a year's worth of training. Whatever diamond you wind up in, it don't much matter. And it doesn't. Everybody learns the same lessons their first year, just like we did. Think fast, work together, use every resource at your disposal. None of them would have much trouble with the material. I knew that the instant I seen a void worthy leftovers. Once you do, you'll bring her up to code. She ain't running right now as much as she is limping, and you both know it. I saw them shoot a worried look at each other. I made an educated guess what it was about. The VSU will supply all the materials you need. Shifty look. To a point. Disappointed look. And finally, if she breaks for any reason before you can fix her, you'll take my ship. Her name's the Garcelle. She was real nice. The galaxy is a funny old place. Sometimes it changes just because a butterfly flapped his wings. In that moment, I was doing what I thought was right. I loved her dearly, but a ship has always been a ship to me. I could find another Garcelle. These days, though, I nice to lie awake, wondering what might have been. What if I hadn't put her on the table? What if I hadn't convinced them? What if there had been someone else to teach them back at the convoy? I've never been one to ponder if something is out there pulling all our strings. But that butterfly flapping his wings just for me? Well, let's just say it makes me real graceful. Ajax didn't know what to make of my offer. Acelia took it more in stride, but not by much. You... why? I stalled for a bit, avoiding the real question. It's tradition to fix up a ship. Goes back to the days when we survived a salvage, and it teaches a lot of important lessons. Consider it a rite of passage. And it is, but that's neither here nor there. I know what the leftovers means to you. The Garso has been my home for a long, long time. So I'm offering you the closest thing I've got to an even trade, because I want you to listen to me. I have something to say. No more stalling, I slammed an empty shot glass down. Credit to him, neither so much as flinched. I don't know what was going through your head coming after my convoy, but I know exactly what sort of road it starts you on. You think your papa would be proud of that little stunt? There's a roll of emotions going over his face. Hers, too. I touched a nerve. I roared an opened one. But I kept pushing. You don't have to admit it to me, or your sister. You don't even have to admit it to yourself. But you know what the answer is. Ajax boiled over. Said a lot of words of me I will not be repeating here. It was quite the tirade, in all honesty. Not that I blamed him. Poor kid had more than enough stewing in his pot. You didn't even know him and you don't know us. What the hell are you even doing here? Why do you even care? He chopped his arm out, sweeping at the entire world. It looked like he was trying to hit all of it, all at once. So I pulled mine in and placed it over my heart. I'm here because I've seen your ship. I've seen that picture you keep hanging over the window. If you can believe it, I've seen ships and pictures like it before. So I'm here to help. I even have a little story for you. Both of them looked like they'd been punched in the gut. I kept going. That gun will eat your fingers, one by one. You pull the trigger with intent for the first time, bang, it says, and someone falls over, all bloody and writhing. It wasn't my fault, you say. I didn't have a choice, and that might even be true. But it won't stop at your fingers. That gun will eat your hands, one by one. You pull them out, and they're covered in burn marks. Callous. Scars. Bang, bang, they say. Remember us? Remember that fight you almost lost? That bus that plugged you? Don't you want to feel strong? Don't you want to feel safe? You're right, I say. I need a bigger gun. And that might even be true, but they won't stop your hands. Those guns will be your thoughts, one by one, until you can't remember the last time you slept soundly, or woke up easily, or lived peacefully. Bang, it says. Let me go, you say. 
I just want to forget. And that will be true. Bang, bang, it says. Bang, bang, bang. Lucky for you, a gun ain't the only thing that'll eat your fingers. You can fill it with a pencil or a welding torch or a toolbox, if you're so inclined. You can even hold the throttle of a ship. But only if you want to. And I believe you do. Because when a boy in the rickety old junker makes a pass of my haulers, his heart rate was elevated. His hands were shaking, he was scared out of his mind, and he stopped. He let go of his gun. You ain't no mean old pirate, are you, son? Ajax shook his head. Poor kid. This wasn't his fault, not really. I needed to shock him. That didn't make me feel less awful about it. I know you're not. Which is why I'd like to ask one more time. Join up with the VSU. We know what it's like, having to make your own home. In fact, we're goddamn professionals. A second passed, then another. Asia lowered her gun. Ajax followed, but he wasn't quite finished. How do you know that? About the hands? I learned it from the smartest woman I know. It cost me six years, a proposal, and two gosh to finally bring it out of her. They let me leave them out of the bar after that. Didn't have much to say, not that anybody would. So I took them to the governor's office. Maria was more than happy to meet them. She put them in the comfy chairs, handed out some mints with a bottle on her desk, shared some old hauling stories. When I told her where I found them, her eyes got hard again. Real hard. I almost felt sorry for whoever owned that bar. We said our goodbyes and started heading to the landing strip. I had them load into the gas cell when we got back. On the way out, I gave the leftovers one last pat. I called in the hauler to pick her up, and we started to lift off that colony planet. But life always has to throw a wrench in somewhere. The worst thing that could have happened, happened. I had a good reason why I was so desperate to get the kids off that ship. Well, a couple of good reasons, but one that was at the forefront of my mind. The leftovers was a ticking time bomb. She was held together with duct tape and prayers, and a couple of those had come loose after the damn burn Ajax took her on. She was going to crumple her main support, lose all power, then blow a reactor. The only question was when. That ship would have killed them. I planned on having a professional tell them that once we got back to the fleet. Broke the idea to them nice and slow. Then we hit the void proper. I saw the hauler jerk out of the corner of my eye. The leftovers crumbled in half. Just too damn soon. I signaled for my pilot to pull away, then called for the kids. They burst through the doors at a dead sprint. There she was still falling in on herself, but it was only a matter of time. The engine started sputtering, sending her into a tailspin towards the sun. Then the reactor collapsed. One almighty flash later and the leftovers was no more. Ajax and Acelia were inconsolable, screaming and crying, telling me it was all their fault. I took it on the chin. They weren't exactly wrong. I didn't know if your uncle and mama were ever going to forgive me, but that's a story for another day. It's your bedtime. Nope, I ain't budging on this one. Come on. There's always more space tomorrow. Good night, my little pirate. Sleep tight. And don't let the space box bite.